Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about tools. I'm Jen Mathiason, an objects conservator based in South Yorkshire. I'm Chloe Ramsey, an objects conservator based in Greater Manchester. And I'm Christina Rizek, an objects conservator based in Cambridgeshire. Hi guys. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> should we do some news first? Maybe let's do some news. Yeah. yeah. What's what's cooking in the world? Well, I mean, I suppose for starters, we did a, a panel at uh, a live streamed panel. Oh yeah, we may have mentioned it. We yeah, may have seen at, uh, a little bit on Twitter. Yeah, at uh, Icons AGM, which was very good. It was, it was brilliant. It was about uh, diversity and uh, all those challenges that come with that and uh, how, what we can do, really. And that's still available on Icons Facebook page. And uh, we'll also be bunging something on our YouTube channel at some point. But uh, no promises. It's probably going to be after Christmas. <laughs> oh my God, Christmas. <laughs> Do we have anything else to tell people? So I just saw, I'm, I'm on the uh, mailing list at work for the Social History Curators Group. Um, mm-hmm. And they tend to share various, like, what's this object? Which I find really interesting generally. Um, but they also shared a call for papers for The Art of the Lost, Destruction and Change uh, which is a working title for a two-day conference at Canterbury Cathedral from the 27th to the 29th of November next year um, as part of their their project to um, research and present the, the cultural history of Canterbury Cathedral. So I think they're advi- inviting other papers from similar a similar set of pro- reached research goals, I believe. Um, and the deadline for that is the 25th of January. So have a Google, find out a bit more about that, uh, more than I've given you. Um, <laughs> So another thing to note is that um, applications are now open for bursaries to attend the ICON um, Triennial Conference next year. Oh, yeah. um, they So they have the details of that on their website. You can find this t- uh, tweet through Twitter, obviously. And this these bursaries are provided by various partners um, that you can read about on their website um, and you can go through and, and see which one suits you. Um, so have a look because, I mean, it's pretty pricey, the conference. Um, so if you need help with it, help is available. And that is good. Go get it. Yeah. <laughs> Reference back to our funding episode of the season. <laughs> yeah. Last season, of last season. <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> All right, ladies, we're talking tools today. I'm very curious what's in what, what's in your toolkit. I'm actually really amazed that we haven't had an episode. I know. About, like, what, how many episodes have we done now? We've not talked about tools. This is something that we just yeah. we deal with literally every day of our lives. And conservatives love talking about their oh tools, don't god. they? <laughs> oh my god! You know, I actually watched a YouTube video this morning over breakfast because I'm an insane person. <laughs> um, it's a very lovely video. It's with uh, Richard Hawkes, who's a paper conservator. Oh uh, what? yes, I've seen. Seen various things from yeah. him, yeah. And he's being interviewed by a group called Objectivity. I saw that. Yeah, and it's Sorry. a really good video just about, yeah, definitely bugging a link to that in the show notes, uh, just about kind of introducing the tools of a paper conservator. And as a non-paper conservator, MISC conservator, I, uh, <laughs> I, I found that really interesting because there's some o- overlap, but it's always good to see people's tools and it's really fun and hearing the stories and it was just really good. So yeah, we'll definitely link to that, definitely. So should we start with you, Christina? What's in your toolkit? Oh, God. I mean, I guess the same sorts of things that are in every conservator's toolkit. I'm rather wishing I'd gone upstairs and got it now. <laughs> well, you, you, um, you can. We will and, allow it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, OK. Do you want to give me one minute? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I am back from running upstairs and I can't find my main toolbox, which is a bit embarrassing, um, but I've got the sort of subsidiary bits, which are all the extra things. So I have, that is a chocolate, French chocolate tin, which I keep brushes in, um, which I use because it is very long (laughs) and brushes are really long. Mm. Did you get lots of chocolate in it? So I can... I don't honestly remember. I mean, I've had it for, you know, 15 years or so. Fair enough. Um, I'm just having a look. I should say, this stuff hasn't actually been in use very much recently because I've just been using the tools at work. There's loads of brushes in it. I have also got a Benefit makeup case. Stylish. um, Which seems to have a stencil brush and some nitrile gloves and some scalpel blades. I've got a weird box like that. Make of that what you will. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not the most useful assortment. 
And then I've also got, oh my God, this stuff's dusty. Um, I've also got a wire cutlery organiser thing or desk organiser. Ah, yes. Thing. Although it's not actually very useful because it's wire, so little things fall through the gaps, but that was just for sort of overflow storage. But my main thing is a kind of plastic toolbox of the sort with lots of little plastic dividers in where, where mm. you can take out some of them to make the compartments bigger or smaller. Ooh, I don't know if you know the yeah, kind of thing yeah, there. I've got one of those for Just beads. like a kind of flat, yeah, flat good. plastic toolbox. Good. Yeah. Um, however, I did go to my local fabric shop several months ago <laughs> under the influence of one of the conservators I'm currently working with, who is incredibly crafty and always making stuff. And she kind of inspired me to have a go at making a tool roll. And I've bought the fabric, but I haven't made the tool roll, <laughs> which is why I can't find I, I have tools. like enough fabric for like <laughs> 10 tool rolls that I've never made. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, all the interesting tools are in the main toolbox. This is mainly kind of like sculpting spatulas and stuff like that. And mm. There's a glass glass bristle brush, which I haven't used since I was a student. <laughs> I hate um, those things. Uh, there's a wooden spatula that is caked in something. I clearly didn't clean it up properly. <laughs> this is all quite embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> I feel like it's a familiar story because someone on Twitter when we asked, I mean, we'll talk about this later, but someone on Twitter when we asked what your favourite scalpel, scalpel blade <laughs> is that. said uh, something not caked in adhesive. <laughs> Actually, do you do you want to do you want to rummage for me? Because oh, yeah, in, that blue, in that blue bag behind you, there might be a tool. The roll. massive bag. Yeah, there's definitely, you know, With something a cardigan else. on it. Yes. Hashtag conservation. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag no wear rules. <laughs> um... Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, the tool Ooh. roll. Oh, I see. Oh, is this going to be the feature where I open it up and have a look? Oh, my God. I remember this. Was it this is. a gift? Yeah. From... So this is my tool roll. Duh. It's beautiful, uh, listeners. I'll, it's I'll beautiful. Take photos. It's from Inherent Vice Squad, and it was a gift. So that's an American company, and they do really beautiful tool rolls. So I've got in here, I've got my favourite marking pen. I've got tweezers, tiny bachelors, good scissors. Good scissors are important. Good scissors are important a pin vice kind of holder thing that I've never actually used. I've never used but mine. But because it came in my student <laughs> toolkit, it's mine forever. Two kinds of scalpel handles because you never know what you might find. More spatulas. A set of brushes that I'm precious about because they're good sizes. And it was a palette knife, by the way, the spatulings. Oh, yeah, palette knife. There we go. <laughs> I, I, can't, I cannot use words today. So that's an excellent day to do podcasts. <laughs> Various kinds of tiny knives, more tweezers. Oh, I love fine tweezers. Oh my God, I have a fine sad tweezers. story to tell you about fine tweezers later. Oh my God. Best thing ever. Uh, I've got a wooden toothbrush because I've fallen in love with wooden toothbrushes. I take it you mean the handle is wooden? Yes. I think they're made of bamboo, actually. But yeah, uh, I really like these. They're very good. You can buy like sets of them cheaply on eBay. And because I'm a cheapskate, I love that sort of stuff. Uh, and they last forever. And I've also got one of those little um, nail buffing boards and emery board combination thingies. Mm -hmm. um, and usually in here, there's also some makeup brushes, but I've clearly left them at work. So yeah, so that's what's in my tool roll. And then I have two different boxes <laughs> of other bits of tools and equipment because I'm a, I'm a crazy person. Uh, obviously, I mostly use the things that are like already in the lab. It's kind of communal for everyone that's in the lab. Like There's a lot of that going on as well. So I don't, it's not like I need to supply everything, but this is kind of my base kit that I really enjoy. So in there, there's like a massive box as well. Okay. Oh, oh, and the, some clamps. There's oh, some yes. great clamps. These are good. Yeah, this is because I use them on like Friday. Uh, um, what did you use them for? Basically, we had a big wooden box and like the beading had pinged off. Oh. So I needed to clamp it back on and put adhesive on and stuff. So these are model making clamps. They're quite pricey. It's like ten, like 15 quid a pair. Ooh, but they're, worth it though. They're really good because uh, I, I used them at a university for mm -hmm. ceramics. <laughs> Really, oh, I remember really, really, really you doing good. this. We sat next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> so they were really, really good and I'm in love with them. And they have like these gentle little rubber feet so that you don't need to pad them very much and stuff. I really like them. Um, I'll, I'll post a picture of them uh, because I'm slightly obsessed with them. See, okay, what's what's in the box? What's in the box? There's this giant... Oh, my God. I don't know if my back can take this. Ugh. Oh, my God. Okay, yeah. So What is it? Yeah. <laughs> That's the weight of preparedness right there. So this is a really useful box. And inside it, I've got loads of post-it notes, because this is where I had my post-it notes. Please don't listen, colleagues. Um, I've got spare tape for my label maker, because I have oh a label maker. Oh my god, maker. label maker. Swoon. Um, 
This is also where my uh, steel cap toe boots live because uh, they're very much mine. Mine forever. They were a gift from a friend. I love that my friends give me weird <laughs> like that because <laughs> they know me. Uh, and then I've got one of these like slimmer, really useful uh, boxes, which are I think are meant for pens. And in here I've got my, what, what do we call these again? Squidges. Air puffers? Air puffers. Not I don't squidges. know if that's a... Squidge, squidge. <laughs> uh, Does it sound if you... That's coming that through beautifully. <laughs> oh, those um, things that are used by photographers. Do you mean the things that are the little round things that are used by photographers to puff air? Yes. Technically, things. this one says to, to clear dust and so on. I've taken the brush bit. Off. I drew a face on mine, so it looked like oh. a really bloated fish. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love that. Do you know like what? I can't. I can't look at it now, though, because for babies, they sell things that are nasal aspirators. Oh dear. Um, oh. Snot suckers, basically. Oh dear. <laughs> which are almost identical to that, except that instead of blowing stuff, they're supposed to suck the snot out of your yeah um, congested baby's nose. So, oh dear! Um, I can't really look at them in the same light now. <laughs> yeah, no, I uh, I can see that. <laughs> uh, anyway, what else is in here? Scalpel blades are very kind because I'm always on the go. My porcupine quill and also my dental tools, which were a gift from a friend uh, who sadly left conservation. Sad face. Uh, and then the tiniest screwdriver because sometimes you just need the tiniest screwdriver. It's really tiny. And then I've got another one. Oh my god, that! Yeah, it's underneath <laughs> all of our jackets. But, um... Oops. Do you want me to get that as well? Yes, please. Okay, like just that. a sec. Chloe, Chloe's currently trying to figure out how my toolbox works, which is very adorable. I don't get it. So oh, it's, it's a double... T- yeah, oh, so, so the top just comes Yeah, out. yeah. So it's a double thing. Like a basket! Yeah, okay, so... This is a toolbox that I got at Lidl, which oh, I love. Oh, so cute! And, like, the, un- the bit underneath it forms a basket. You have, like, handles that you can it's carry It's like up. a little shopping basket. Yeah, so you can have that separately. Oh. And then it has a lid that cl- that kind of clamps on, on top. Like that? Yeah, uh, which has smaller compartments in it. You've got a tiny saw! In which I have a tiny saw, my coloured pencils, and loads oh of wooden God. toothbrushes. There's like 15 in here. Uh, my glass cutting tools good clippers and f- uh, model files oh as my well God. because you never know when you need to file what something what is this that's my glass cutting tool ah so it's shop oh my god this is the best toolkit i've ever seen <laughs> usually here that's a tiny torch. a torch tiny torch this is usually oh. where my clamps live so i'm gonna have to put them back and i've got measuring tapes in here as well and in the bottom uh, is uh my tacking hammer <laughs> and usually my label maker so this brings probably gives you an image of the kind of weird stuff that i do so mine might be a bit more industrial than someone else's uh, can i just say i've just found my other toolkit oh well Ooh, done on the floor yes. in the study where i am now uh i have so many dental tools <laughs> Uh, and most of it is, in fact, scalpel handles, dental tools, tweezers, mm-hmm. pliers, that oh, kind yeah. of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and little sculpting spatulas and sculpting tools, the really sort of bendy ones you get from Tiranti. Mm, yeah. So nothing else particularly exciting, apart from a few empty sample pots and a tape measure and a pencil sharpener. And the uh, it's incorporated a toolkit that someone else gave me which was my uncle gave me a sort of like 50 year old dissection kit my uncle's a research scientist that's so cool and he gave me this really old dissection kit which has got lots of scalpels with fixed handles and sort of mounted needles and all sorts of things you need for dissection but i like the fact that that's that's sort of come from there and jenny you mentioned as well sort of being given tools by a friend and i think that's one of the nice things is the way that we kind of acquire these things through not just by buying them oh on mass but you pick them up through Uh, over the years there's a a tool that i haven't included and that was also a gift and it's a kistka uh which is an egg Mm. an an egg decorating tool uh, where you you basically melt something and you kind of you can do very fine detail with it like whatever you're melting into it it's a very specialized tool that i hadn't encountered until we did that cyclododocaine at conference a few years ago because loads of people use mm-hmm. cyclododocaine in that way that they use a kiss to get for it and they're very popular in america and in eastern europe and somehow they kind of haven't made it over here so i had an american friend send me one uh, which i then have to use like a, a converter for because they have different voltages and stuff but like yeah, so mine's electric. Uh, That's so than, cool. Yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, right, okay. I was going to say, you can get um, chantings, which are batik 
tools here with a sort oh, of yeah, of course, yeah, uh, bowl that you melt wax in. Um, but the kiskas often have a finer point, yeah. I think, and and you can get electric ones, which is amazing. Yes, so so, so yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, I'd forgotten about that one. So yeah, sweet. But yeah, it, you, you're right. Being given tools is a very nice kind of thing. I feel like in the conservation community, and sometimes I manage to convince other friends who are like outside of the circle to like give me some tools <laughs> uh, and it's very handy because I, I can i can ask my other half for tools so chloe what's in your toolbox i know i assume you haven't got it with you so i've not got it with me um my toolbox so i spent a small very small while being sort of freelance or being so short term that i just bought myself a big big old builder's toolbox and shoved everything in there but not very not much exciting actually um just the standard stuff because everywhere i worked the the most i found that the most useful stuff to me was already at the the location that i was working um but mm. now i'm at my current place of work in a textiles conservation studio um my attitude to tools has kind of changed quite a lot is it now exclusively needles <laughs> No, but this, this shows how little I know about textile conservation. <laughs> the the purpose of of well, very fine nose tweezers are now wildly important to me, um, and I already had a set which is very nice because they're beautiful. Fine snips as well. I had obviously done some textiles conservation before this, um, and I don't think I really realised how difficult it is to get hold of curved oh, needles yeah. of the right size. I know they're suture needles. I get that, but you can't get them on the normal era and the yeah, normal. Really hard. Well, how do you get them? I have a website for that. <gasps> Thanks. So that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> it's the only place I've found it. And I had to ask Phil from oh, okay. about where he got his. Shout out Phil Parks. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, so... Um, what this is this is also the good thing that you can ask other conservatives. Yeah. Oh my God, where did you get that? I need that in my life, please. I have and a they, couple of things like that that I want to talk about. And, and usually they just go, oh, obviously. Or I have a connection. I can find you one I'll on the black market. <laughs> <laughs> things that I really like, the stuff that I find really useful is a set of scales standardized scales that mm. i bought from um an archaeology archaeology supply oh, shop they same. were really good yeah. though the most useful one i have lost somehow i have a pair of fiskers scissors which Ooh, yeah. are so beautiful because i work a lot with um sewing with fine silks i have a uv torch Nice. I really like that. That's really good. And the other thing that I keep finding myself using is it is a clip-on macro lens for my phone. Mm. And you can put it right next to the object. And it's actually an amazing magnifying glass. Well, a way of taking um, magnified images. That amazing. And I use it all the time. It's so useful. It's so oh, useful. I will um, send you some photos to um, to share around. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Um, it's really, really good. What else is there? I'm just going to share a small whinge about glass bristle brushes. I think I've used mine <laughs> once, one time. And mm. now I... Every so often, every time I go into my tool roll, which is stripy and covered in birds, by the way, I get glass bristles in myself and I have already <laughs> wrapped them up. I have already hoovered. I have already done all the things that I can think of to try and contain these f bristles, <laughs> but they won't be contained. Mine are in a separate I'm going to throw it away. I've thrown it away. Mm. I, that is the ne that's the next step. <laughs> that's the next step. Um, do we want to talk about what our favourite tool might be? Uh, mine is one, not one in my possession, so I think somebody else should start. Uh, What's your favourite tool? No, that's fine. It can be something that you okay. don't possess. Shall I? Okay, so my favourite tool is actually, I don't know if it's a conservation tool as such. It was introduced to me by the lovely ladies at the V&A. I don't have one, obviously, in my possession. Um, I think she, they said they got them from Japan, okay. I think. I'm going to describe it as a tweezer clamp. It's essentially a, a sort of a sort of set of tweezers with a a, a, a loose ring on it oh. that can be moved to the end and wedged, and it's just it's just very very useful. Fascinating. Yeah, I've it's, never seen one. It's difficult to describe the utility of it. I can clamp one end to it and turn turn fine tubes inside out and stuff. It sounds very random, but. Um, mm. But it's oh. very interesting. I don't know what the proper name for it is. Okay. Um, but there's Hopefully a number of the, the V&A ladies have nice. them in their possession. Well, if any of them are listening, let, let us know what it's called, because that sounds amazing. Uh, send, send us a photo. I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker just for scalpel handles, I'm not going to lie. Because oh, yeah. It, my, my scalpel is my best friend. <laughs> it just is. 
I oh, I, I have a particular brush that I cannot veer away from. Okay. I can't avoid it's there's one for the the brush vac and it's actually a very specific kind of firm bristled one for mm. more um resilient materials that uh-huh. require just a little bit extra. Yeah. Um and then there's a, an adhesive application one which is so fine and then I have trimmed it in in such a way as to make it even finer and it's just beautiful. Mm. It's beautiful. Mm. How about you, Christina? Can I choose two? Yes. Yes. One is the Taranti, I'm just looking at their website, and they describe it as a stainless steel leaf spatula. Ooh. Um, I think that's the thing I'm looking at. And it's a metal spatula. They sell them in different sizes and from really quite small, a few millimetres wide, to quite a lot more chunky. But what I like about them is the spatula end is very thin and very flexible and I've just found it so useful for so many things but particularly um, working on organic materials it's quite useful for backing things or slipping a piece of Japanese tissue that you've coated with paste or clusoji or something behind something and you, you can you can just lift up a sheet of Japanese tissue on the spatula and slip it behind something and back things and then you can press something down and pull the spatula out smoothly and I don't know I just absolutely love it I love the flexibility the other thing I've just been trying to find out online what they're called but I can't but was introduced to them when I worked in a particular museum and they called them eye surgeon scalpels slightly worrying eye surgeon I worked there wow yes it, it's got it's got very very small blades that are just a few millimeters wide and um you can get blades that are more sort of chisel shaped so that the sharp bit is at the top rather than along the oh, side oh. if that makes sense yeah. and they're just really small and they're brilliant for paring little things down or just making little tiny cuts and stuff and so on unlike i can't find the handle now so but from memory um Unlike other scalpel blades, they don't clip on. They haven't got a hole in them and they clip onto the handle. Mm -hmm. Um, You sort of put them in and tighten them up. So they're held in a kind of clamp thing. Mm -hmm. And then they've got a a sort of tubular handle. Can't find what they are, but they are something surgical (laughs) anyway. And if I can find out what they are, I can put a link in the show notes Mm. because I think they're brilliant. It is amazing, isn't it, how often we kind of borrow pick and borrow tools from not just craft but also everything surgery as you were saying Mm. uh, and archaeology because we i like anything this is kind of anything can be a tool i have this kind of fanciful feeling that um it's been said before that conservation is like is basically we're doctors but for objects Mm. um and i've referred to when we've had um school groups in and stuff to the studio i've I've called it the object hospital and stuff so it's it's, this kind of it's really nice that we can also borrow tools and hand skills and and ways of thinking about stuff from medical professions i really like it right so we asked people on twitter to uh always to tell us about their favorite tools and like actually tools in general so we posted a question day for a little while and uh, here are some of the responses so one was obviously the one that we just talked about what's your favorite tool and why and someone says i'm hesitating between my beloved micro spatula bought on a school trip in florence or my perfectly shaped teflon bone folder i can see that being a tough choice claire Lorraine says, one of my favourites is an old piano key from a wrecked piano. I love it because it's no cost, carbon neutral, recycled, reused, thin, flexible and extremely useful. And she does post a picture with that. Lucy writes in and says, uh, toothbrushes and my self-standing pet hairdryer. That what? sounds amazing. <laughs> Uh, and someone else says, my glass weights. Uh, she said that she actually made them at an internship. Perks of being at a glass museum. Uh, wow. Use them all the time. Ooh. Inert, flat, heavy and transparent. They look fabulous. Oh, they do. They're, they're like little, like just glass blobs, mm-hmm. but very, very satisfying somehow. I like the look of those because the ones that I use um, have sharp edges. And Ooh, yeah. well, I say they're not sharp they're square yeah but it does mean that i'm kind of extra cautious if i put something if i put a glass weight directly on the surface of an object yeah. without a barrier layer mm-hmm. i am sort of super super careful yeah but they look nice and round and soft uh we asked what's your least favorite tool any that just don't work for you and uh, so someone got back and said clues all g for mounting documents but technically that's uh, more of a supply than a tool least favorite tool um I'm, I mean, I've clearly never used that pin vice, so I clearly don't use very stabby things. I clearly don't do that. Um, 
I've got a bone folder I've pretty much never used and Same. I only That's bought true. it because Everybody said to me, oh, my God, you must get a bone folder. They're yes, so same. Uh, I also oh, felt like a bone folder. I also felt In retrospect, that. I think these people were book and paper conservators, but as an objects conservator, I've used it maybe two or three times. It's probably my least favourite tool, not because of how rarely I use it, but because I feel, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like people told me to buy a bone yeah. folder and then I didn't know what to do with that. And I think that's the issue. Like sometimes you'll get a tool because someone said it said it's amazing. And then you're like, I, how, how do they make this work exactly? <laughs> I'm just not really sure because... Yeah, some things are more intuitive than others. And seemingly, I don't get along with bone folders. It's a shame. Oh, I love bone folding tools. I have used them inside work, outside work, uh, everything. I love it. You need to teach us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you I and I need say, to have a workshop um, on this. We'll, we'll, listen to these a bit, we'll listen to these a bit later in the episode. But I went and interviewed some of the people I work with um, about tools and their favourite and least favourite tools and so on. Mm. One of the people I, introdu- I interviewed was a book conservator. After the interview, I said this thing about bone folders uh, because he had several in his drawer, which he'd shaped to particular um, shapes just to to suit him and and to carry out different tasks. And he then proceeded to demonstrate all the things you can do on a book with a bone folder. Wow. Wow. Now I've not had that. I would love that. It sounds like they are invaluable for books. (laughs) But I still haven't managed to find a good use as an objects conservator, Mm. really. Ooh, ooh, there's another paper conservation thing that you that probably all paper conservators listening to will be like, I can't believe they haven't me- mentioned this yet. It's the, how do I describe it? It's the little brush pen thing that you put water oh, in. Oh, yeah. And then you, I've got you paint crafts. water in. Uh, yes, yeah. you paint water onto it in a line and then it makes tearing Japanese tissue much easier. I'm yes. sorry, I don't have the name for that. Uh, I don't work with names. I work with vague descriptions. <laughs> I know the ones you mean, and they're, yeah. and they're actually already on our uh, Pinterest board called Brushes Galore, uh, which is all brushes. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll link to that as well. Uh, and next question was, have you ever turned something into a conservation tool that had a different original purpose? Uh, unfortunately, we only got one reply, and they said, I once made a small solvent chamber out of a transparent plastic lid from a biscuit box, tape and cotton balls. That is Genius. thrifty. That yeah, is genius. Very well done. What have I done? I feel like I've done something like yeah, that. Yeah, I feel before. like I feel like I will have done this on many mm. an occasion, but I just don't remember. Yeah. It's like I'm an excellent MacGyver. <laughs> it's like I will make things happen I mean, with whatever's here. I mean I, I use all sorts of things to prop stuff up temporarily and weight things down and yeah, you know, those yeah, kinds exactly, of jobs. Right? And uh, I mean I used to make weights out of plasticine covered in cling film because Ooh, yeah. um, you can shape them. So mm. that if you're trying to weight down, um, for example, I was working on a wickerwork shield and I was repairing some of the basketry elements, but they were supposed to be curved. And so to weight them down as Ooh. I'd repaired them, oh, yeah. I needed curved weights. And so you can um, shape plasticine into that Genius. kind of shape, wrap it in cling film and pop it on top. So, that's but, really clever. I mean, plasticine is meant to be modelled. <laughs> so I don't know if that's the same or not. I use pegs quite a lot for similar things as well to clamp Japanese tissue repairs on organic objects temporarily mm-hmm. oh brilliant um, i love that weights thing so i've at work we um we have some uh, made handmade by the previous um conservator chamois leather weight bags with just mm. lead shot in them and they're they're kind of the perfect they're not like the um i can't remember the name of them the heritage the, the normal heritage weights the, the quite sort of sturdy weights that we're probably all familiar with well like sandbags yeah they're, they're not quite like them because there's there's basically just less lead shot in them and so they're mm-hmm. really kind of soft and pliable and they they fall flexible they're, yeah, yeah. They're the perfect weight for pretty much anything that i can identify <laughs> um so but yeah moldable to surfaces i think that's really that's really nice and that's for textiles so yeah i really like the idea of being able to make curved weights or flexible weights for three-dimensional mm. objects that's really nice can i just say that i have i have some sort of intense love affair with snake weights Oh, <laughs> snake weights are amazing. I mean, not only are they fun to play with, I know they're used a lot for like keep like books and like, yeah. paper repairs and all that stuff. But I find them immensely useful for uh, more three dimensional mm-hmm. repairs if it's something that's sturdy enough to do this. Because I once like wrapped several of them around. The, this, was, this was in fact a fake bone that mm-hmm. had uh, muscles. Uh, going wow. onto it, but I had to repair where the muscles joined the bone, and I could not 
get gravity to work in my favor here. So I wrapped snake weights around them. What? Was this repeatedly. a frog? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it worked beautifully. And uh, oh my God. And now I, I would just consider snake weights for any job. <laughs> oh, wow. These are great. <laughs> they just put, they just stay where you put them. Yeah. They're amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I love them. What's our next question? Uh, next question was, what do you keep your tools in? Toolbox, tool roll or other container? And people said, in the lab, an old card catalogue for the small things and uh, bookshelves and carts for the big stuff. Oh, I'd love a cart. Travelling, an old school caboodle, which just broke that face. Um, oh, no. Someone else says, I keep the most uh, popular tools in a roll. The rest is stored in an old wooden cookie in old wooden cookie boxes and drawers. I'm afraid they're not labelled and I have to search through all of them each time to be surprised about the amount of tools I actually own. <laughs> Familiar feeling. Uh, someone else says, all of the above, a tool roll for the VIP tools, three toolboxes, brush holders, cutlery trays, various jam jars. And yet somehow I feel like I don't have enough. Oh, <laughs> love it. Someone else says, I have a sort of cutlery tray with narrow compartments originally for packaging electrical parts. Um, someone else says, my personal tools are in a toolbox. The, the department tools are in mobile drawers that were for normal desks, but I've recycled them for storing the conservation tools. Each tool has its own label box within the drawer. And the drawers are also labeled. Now there's someone who loves a label. <laughs> Uh, and then you said that you keep yours in an Ikea trolley. Oh, my God. I love it. I love it. It was um, mm. my wonderful manager's idea. Um, we have three of these. I can't remember the Ikea name of them. They're metal. They're sort of square. And I know the ones. Red, edge rounded. Yeah, they have really nice wheels and you can just scoot them around. They're so stylish. They're white to match the studio. Uh, mine. <laughs> they come in several colours, by the way. <laughs> they do. They, they come in four different colours and they are they're brilliant. I cannot I cannot stress how beautiful they are. I I, I think um I wouldn't underestimate the value of just having a pot on your desk with things sticking out of it. Which is not like a permanent way to store your tools, but it's actually a very, very handy way to have them. Oh no, I Oh yeah. No, that's so true. And I really wanted to say that I really favour those like cheap little cutlery containers or makeup con- like makeup storage mm-hmm. things. Like things that are normally in like the kitchen department or the kind of bathroom like mm-hmm. department of like a you know a store they're really handy for just keeping your tools in like pen pots anything i love keeping things i like have a, an old heavyweight um beaker glass beaker oh nice yeah uh-huh. i've got a mug that i painted in one of those paint your own things oh. and the handle broke off <laughs> and despite being a conservator i couldn't be asked to stick the handle back on <laughs> but i use it as a pen pot at home so because <laughs> i couldn't quite bear to throw it away but <laughs> yeah it gets used as a pen pot <laughs> Uh, right, so the next question was, has anyone got a swab jar that isn't a jam jar with a hole poked in the lid? This question made me laugh so uh, much. And then I think we opened a can of worms because <laughs> it, we turned out to like start examining why we have these jars and like what they are because <laughs> like someone said, does a pasta sauce jar count as something different? And I said yes, mm-hmm. because I think it does. And then they said there might be a hidden hierarchy of swab jars that you've just discovered. Someone says a pesto jar... Someone says, it's always jam. <laughs> uh, someone had a metal metal coffee can with a V cut in the rim. So for pulling sw- swaps right off, no holes in the lid. So that is that is quite legitimately cool. a yeah. very different yeah. one. Uh, and then I said, uh, I've got herring uh, herring jars because... So Swedish. Too Swedish to function. Um, <laughs> uh, you said beetroot jar. Beetroot. Yeah. I mean, I kind of want to conduct a survey of the jars now just to just to figure out what people are bringing in, what kind of brands they are. Are they ones that people like, is anyone bringing in smart price jars or is it all like the slightly posh stuff? I have a related question. Okay. When is it time to change jars? When do people, obviously you empty them. Yeah, obviously. But... Do they ever need to be changed, long, though? They are glass. Well, exactly. How long can you use one jar? And if Until you do you change, smash it. is that how... A jar can last you a lifetime. Exactly. I can't see why you would change it. Well, it- <laughs> Unless you get bored very easily. But then one of the comments said, for 29 years, it's always been jam. So oh, that's true. in what cases were they changed over those 29 years? I think we need more information. <laughs> what was the next be, question? It could just be multiple jam jars. Because I'm... 
because I work in more than one location, so oh, I, yeah, yeah, I have yeah, jars yeah, in each yeah, one. Yep, yeah, I see that. I see that. Oh, it, it, we've gone way off the deep end with jars. Um, uh, then we asked, how do you mark your tools to stop other people from nicking them? And uh, Ugh, I don't, and they get nicked. Well, they have done in the past. They're obviously not in my current place of work, which is <laughs> only one of the conservatives. <laughs> I, I, I have two systems. Either I label them as literally with my full name, uh, because it's label maker. Uh, yes. But that only works for very big tools. <laughs> like my I don't know my hammer but then smaller tools were back when I went to uni I used to put uh, washi tape on them colorful washi tape so that all the ones that were blue polka dot were Jenny's yeah yeah um, and that sort of thing I I don't really label them very much now though even though wandering uh, tool syndrome is a real problem it is yeah Uh, I think I I worry that I am the 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 boundary between my tools and the studio's tools is now so thin that I would have absolutely no idea if I had to take my tools away for some reason I'm never gonna leave but if I was to leave (laughs) I would just have to leave everything there because I've no idea what's mine (laughs) Or take everything with you. Or take everything more. Well, this is all mine now. <laughs> all mine. <laughs> Jenny, does the washi tape stay on? Yeah, it really well actually. I mean, because it's, it's still, paper, it's obviously. Still on, isn't and it? I, I put it on in 2011, so yeah, it stayed on really oh, well man. actually. I'm doing that as a so, so as a as a, a a young and ignorant and uh, stupid conservation student. Um, quite early on in my first year of training, I realised I probably needed to mark my tools. And washi tape hadn't really come to the UK at that point. So yeah. I thought I was being really clever. I, I thought, I know, I need something that won't wash off. I will use nail varnish. And oh. I put uh, a little stripe of maroon nail varnish. You can see where this is going <laughs> on oh, the yeah. handles of lots of things. And obviously, the solvent that I use most is acetone. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the brightest idea I've ever had. I mean, you could you could presumably take the same sort of approach as object marking without the barrier layer and yeah, just using yeah, the exactly. link. Yeah, you could. People have said uh, a strip of blue tape around the handle, which also stops off me from accidentally nicking other people's things and thinking they're mine. Yeah. I taped a piece of Japanese fabric on my favourite spatula and reused the fabric to make little sand weights. Oh, that's excellent. Someone else has a combination of hideously bright flowery prints there. I hoped, I hoped others wouldn't half inch. Didn't work, but it does make it easier to find the culprit. <laughs> uh, name etched into handle, didn't work. Name written on handles, didn't work. Purple tools to match me in my lab, that works best. I'm enjoying the colour coordination. Yeah, love it. That's really great. And someone else has stickers with the initials on them or a dot with a brightly coloured nail polish. Now, here, nail polishes again. Ah! Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> please be careful with your nail polish. Uh, someone else says fluorescent pink paint really works. <laughs> what What do you find goes missing most? Because I found it's definitely tweezers and scissors. I have. Oh, scissors. I, there's, a, there's a pair of scissors um, in my past that I will never see again. It's scissors, knives. Oh, okay. uh, like Stanley knives, that sort of thing, mm-hmm. because they're useful for many things. So people just kind of pick them up. And to be honest with you, screwdrivers. So mm-hmm. anything that's like industrial and multi-purpose, then people just never return them. <laughs> Do you but think? You- um, we, we, I mean, uh, somebody, Chloe, I think it was, was talking about the idea of there being general tools in the lab that were for everyone to use, and then mm-hmm. people having their own personal tools. Do you think that there are particular things that people expect to be? communal um and i'm thinking of things like it's scalpel handles and and knives and stanny knives and stuff like that and i wonder if that's why it wouldn't necessarily occur to people that these are that these belong to a particular person yeah no probably yeah i mean there's probably a certain element of that i think it probably depends on your studio and mm. your inter-studio relationships because if you've got hmm a very small studio then it's you know if you're borrowing somebody else's thing that you know is theirs it doesn't really matter because there's only two desks to look on and it's much easier to keep track of where you got stuff from and put it back but if you're working in a huge studio with loads of different people I imagine it could just become completely chaotic if you didn't have like these are the base scissors but then I mean stuff like that scissors and scalpel scalpel handles and stuff if it's yours, if you've got your own stuff, then you know how to look at. You can you can sort of monitor its its care, mm. um, and you know you can pay attention to whether when you last changed that blade or how clean the scissors are and stuff. Mm. Would but- you expect the studio to provide particular things? Because obviously you'd expect them to provide consumables like scalpel mm, handles yeah. and cotton wool and all of that kind of stuff. 
But then I think more specialized equipment, like when it's something that like costs more than 100 quid to buy, I'm not expecting to mm. have to like fork out for that myself. I would expect no. the no, no, no. organization, that sort of thing, right? So, but in terms of tools, that's a good question. To be honest, I think that we enjoy buying tools too much <laughs> to, to let somebody else buy them possibly uh, well i mean obviously we will get our um i was i was provided with a set of tools that are you know property of the studio but that's not to say that i won't really really enjoy going to certain craft supply shops and if i see you know an extra special pair of snips for example i won't sort of go Ooh, and buy them you know it's the, i think we probably we're too kind of stationary nerdy I, I, as a concert as as the conservation community to really avoid doing that this makes me think of i do wonder where people do go for their tools because obviously there are conservation websites yeah sure but like where do people go for the other tools because you just mentioned craft shops which is accurate i also mm-hmm. go to craft shops and like pick up tools however i am just as happy in b and q or like like the, anywhere that has any tool of any kind wilco has an excellent tool section for the poor conservator i have actually um found some good scissors in fishing supply shops fishing and tackle Ooh. shops and just on that subject i suppose the the value of people's toolkits cumulatively is quite considerable yeah. so i suppose i'm 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 keep asking this question because i'm wondering what it's reasonable to expect conservators to have to buy for themselves and obviously if you enjoy going to shops and craft shops and and picking up all of these kinds of things and adding to your collection in that sort of stationary fetishist kind of way that you mentioned Chloe, then that, <laughs> that's fine but on the other hand, a lot of conservators aren't very well paid and you're expected yeah. to have yeah. your own yeah. tools from the outset, from when you're a student and so on. And I think it's part of it is that sort of understanding we have of ourselves as professionals who might go and work in several different contexts and take our tools with us. It's not like you kind of turn up to work and they provide everything for you and then when you leave, you leave it behind and you go to another employer and they provide everything. I think there is this sense that we are somehow mobile professionals who... Mm -hmm have our own yeah. personal collections and take it with us. That's good but point. I'm just wondering if that is actually a slightly weird and unreasonable idea in some ways, when taken to extremes, at least. Yeah. Because I think, I think you, you know, are we're, probably we're right. We're potentially asking people to lay out hundreds of pounds, potentially. Yeah, I think you're onto something there. And I think that is another one of these things that we discussed recently about a barrier to entry into the profession is that, oh, you know, <laughs> welcome, you, you're going to spend thousands of pounds on getting your education and also you have to buy your own tools in that in that vein uh, we also asked what's the most expensive tool you've ever bought and the cheapest which i thought was a brilliant question so the replies were the cheapest was the porcupine quill my friend gave me which worked which works well as a gentle pick the most expensive is an uh, oh, ophthalmology scalpel um, ah, those are the ones I was talking about. Yeah, so that's that's ones. the same thing you talked about. Yay! Oh, I see. That's so cool. And then someone said tweezers f- for about 60 or 70 pounds. In my defense, Whoa. they are amazing reverse tweezers. Cheapest was also tweezers. Bamboo ones were about 20p. Both do different jobs. Both are excellent at it. I uh, really enjoyed that one. And someone else says, my most expensive is a Felder combination woodwork machine. God, that sounds so (laughs) hardcore. That's amazing. And cheapest, probably kebab sticks. I have a tragic story to tell. Oh, God. (laughs) Relating to tweezers. I don't know how much other people will care, but to me it's... (sighs) This is a difficult moment for you. It's a difficult moment. Okay. Two weeks ago, I dropped my favourite fine nose tweezers. Oh, no. I know where this is going. (laughs) Mm. They landed oh. nose down oh. into the linoleum of the studio. Oh. And they're completely ruined. <laughs> they're completely fucked. They are <laughs> fucked. I have to just I'm, find I'm, some more. I'm so sorry for your loss. <sighs> Thank you. Mm. If I'd known, I would have gotten you some Christmas ones. <laughs> um, I took a photo because I knew we were doing this episode. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. We'll I sort that. of stared at them in horror for a good 30 seconds and then, like, fine. And then you, fine. And then you had to move on with your life. I had to move on with my life. But that is sad. I, I tried to fix it. them. It, they'll never be the same again. No, that's the problem, isn't it? And then, finally, we, of course, had to ask people, what is your favourite scalpel blade? <laughs> 
Uh, 15 did come out reasonably strongly on top, although 10 and 11 were both quite favoured as well. You can't beat a 15. <laughs> we are fans of 10 8. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, and then uh, some of the outliers. Or 26. Were- so I was going to say some of the outliers were 21, 22A, 25A. Um, what the hell are they? Uh, yeah, I, so I've I've got, I've got a uh, chart up. So let's Ooh. see. 10 is the kind of big curved one. 11 is the really pointy one. That's the one my other half favours. So we can't speak. Mm. Um, 10A is like 11, but not as pointy. <laughs> oh, yeah, fair enough. That, uh, that, that makes sense. And then in the 20s, they're kind of massive. Like, they're just mm-hmm. really, really big. They look like little cleavers. I use those ones to cut plaster soap. But the, the 25 yep. is very pointy. I really love when people express preferences for scalpel blades because it's just so interesting to me. 12 so, and 12B look terrifying. Oh, yeah. They're the really hooked ones. Mm, uh, they we, look like the, the velocity. Oh, I've always wondered what on blade. earth you would use them for. Yeah, same. Yeah, we have them in the lab and I do not know. <laughs> I once found a chart that actually told you what those blades were used for in surgery oh really wow uh, i don't know which if is I want something to know that. I, I really wish i hadn't read <laughs> <laughs> yeah so those were the questions we posed on twitter and then uh, i found that aic had recently uh, in september in fact asked people what kind of tools they use and like what's an unusual tool that sort of thing and there were some good answers in that thread as well so some of the excellent examples included butter dishes as micro chambers what that's genius yeah. <laughs> it is uh, and now i desperately want to go and buy some like clear glass <laughs> butter dishes someone else said a septum elevator for paper conservation i don't know what one is or what you would use it for but i'm intrigued <laughs> equine dental descalers to remove coral concretions oh, from God. from things found in marine environments oh that makes me feel a bit squiffy Ooh. really Maybe I'm very squeamish. I feel like I've come across very squeamish in this episode. Perhaps I am. <laughs> and then nose clips for pulmonary function tests as little clamps. Again, <laughs> do, do you people just have like medical suppliers who are willing to talk to you? Because I feel like I can't get that. Sh- but but that sounds amazing. And then someone said mint tins filled with shot and wrapped in book cloth for weights. So that's oh, more homemade that's cool. weights, which yeah. I love. And then someone uh, pointed out that si- uh, those silicon pastry brushes used for oh. baking are really good for um, like putting stuff on sometimes. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I was like, oh, baking supplies. I hadn't considered that That's one yet. That's a whole other avenue, isn't oh, it? Oh, my yeah. God. I, I've just remembered somebody telling me about that. And she uses them for applying B72 over large areas. And then you can soak them in water. And obviously the B72 will peel off the silicon afterwards. Oh, of course. Now, that's genius. And you can reuse them. That's, That's genius. genius. That's amazing. Uh, what was I thinking? Uh, oh, yes. And then I can't remember who this is. Sorry uh, if you're listening. But someone told me that they use a one of those tea strainers as a little sieve when they need <gasps> sieve powders, which is genius. Ooh, yes. Uh, and I can't remember who said that. Uh, if you're out there, let me know. Right. So I just wanted to say that if anyone is interested in uh, getting to know tools from other professions and that sort of thing, then... I would actually recommend a Reddit subreddit, which is r slash specialized tools, because that is a satisfying and weird subreddit where there's a lot of videos of people using highly specialized tools. And uh, I feel like there's a market for that for conservatives. Um, And then also, I would really like to recommend Adam Savage's inexpensive beginner's toolkit. So he did a podcast on what kind of tools he uses. He's a prop maker for films and stuff like that. Compiled a list of inexpensive basics that you should have in a toolkit if you're a maker. Now, I know that we don't think of ourselves as that, but there's a lot of overlap because I've looked at the list and a lot of them are just like, well, yeah, actually, if you're an objects conservator working on anything bigger than an A5 sheet of paper, then yes, actually, <laughs> these are very useful things. And I like that they went for the inexpensive ones. Now, it the, it's based in America, so it is American tools and like it's it's what's cheap there. But it's still well worth a look. And it's really fascinating yeah. seeing other people. And Adam Savage speaks really well about the crafts and, oh, definitely. and stuff. So he, and he's quite sort of, if you watch various of his YouTube things, he's very sort of versatile with the way he thinks and talks about yeah making and, and doing more stuff. importantly he explains kind of how how he uses them yeah what he has found them useful for in the past and uh, i just find that really interesting because sometimes there's like i i just compile a wish list based on what i've seen in that video it's just <laughs> like oh my god that will be brilliant for my work i had no idea didn't know that existed it's used for carpentry or it's used for surgery or you know like just 
it just kind of opens your horizons a bit for what you might need. So it depends on what kind of conservation you're into, really. But uh, I do recommend that. So I'll pop a link to that uh, because it's brilliant. And also, I love Adam Savage. Uh, so basically, we asked you listeners for contributions and so that you would talk about your tools. And uh, we can listen to a few now. Hello, my name is Sophie and I work as a stone conservator for the Antiquities Collection in Berlin in Germany. My favorite tool is the Ecopra Electric Eraser. It is a heavy, durable and solid machine which works relatively noiseless. Different eraser strips can be inserted and used dry or moistened a bit. I use it for dry cleaning smooth or polished stone surfaces, especially of stones that are sensitive to moisture like alabaster. With a moistened tip, I get good cleaning results for reducing dust and grime with very good controllable pressure and limited rubbing action. I find my tools mostly by looking into other conservators' workshops. It is especially interesting to me to visit labs of other fields. This was also the way I got to know the electric eraser. In the lab, I store my tools in labeled cupboards and drawers, and at home I have several tool suitcases. I really like the tool suitcases which are stackable to combine different compartments and to be able to move and travel around with them. And I like small tool quivers to safely store my dental tools, my scalpels and spatulas. Hello, I'm Valentina from Turin. I'm the film conservator of the National Film Archive of Italian Resistance. My favorite tool is the Fin Splicer because I use it for projection in my everyday work in the archive. It's always been a connection between the different sides of my job. I buy my tools from international suppliers like Duncan or in local specialized shops. I and my colleague Adriana, in charge of education projects, are making a lab book for children of primary school with drawings of all tools I use for working. Pin boxes and cores, glowers, scissors, scalpers, solvents, glue adhesive tape and, of course, splicers. It's going to be very nice. We also had two people write in with their contributions for the tool episode. Hannah writes in, Hello, I'm Hannah, and I'm currently a Mellon Fellow in Textile Conservation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. My favourite tools are square-nosed stamp tweezers. I have two pairs and I use them as a teeny pair of hands. They're great for picking up and placing things, holding things in place without a pointy tip. I think I got them from eBay. Also, generally pokey things the sculptors use. I love university art suppliers for cheap pokey things. I used to keep my tools in a tool roll. Then I combined my pencil case and toolkit into a single 1.7 litre really useful box after a couple of colleagues did the same thing. Uh, great for taking tools around with you. It's also good that it's clear so that I can see everything. I have little bits of plasters out at the ends of all the sharp things. Thanks, guys. Aw. Thanks for writing in, Hannah. And we've got someone else writing in saying that the most expensive item they've bought is actually some special gum, which was 80 euros for 250 grams of powder in a conservation shop. Apparently one kilo of the same stuff sells for $10 in China, and it's exactly the same, but it's uh, but she says it's very difficult to get understood in China, so fair enough. Uh, she also writes in and says that her scalpel blade box is a tampon tin box, which she's custom painted. And she says, hey, it's a mostly female profession after all. And we keep talking about empowerment. Is that some sort of statement? I <laughs> uh, loved hearing about that. That's fantastic. Thanks very much for writing in. Thanks so much for those. That was great. It's really nice to hear from people and how they use things. Yeah. So I also went and asked some of the other conservators in the town where I work for their thoughts about tools. And I asked them some of the same questions that we've been talking about now. So here are their responses. In the very first interview, Flavia actually said that her favourite tools were silicon tipped spatulas. But unfortunately, a technical malfunction with the recording equipment meant that it just came out as a shh. So what's your favourite tool and why? Definitely. Okay. I think it's great for applying pressure on things, but uh -huh. not too much pressure. And uh, you can use it to move things about, like paint flakes when you're <laughs> repositioning them. Though it is annoying if the paint flakes are too small that 
they get sort of sucked up by the static of it. Yeah. Um, but it, it's great for um, applying backings as well because you can yeah. use it to gently smooth over some tissue paper when uh-huh. you're um, sticking it down with some adhesive. So just a generally really handy tool. Okay. What's your least favourite tool? Is there anything you just don't get on with? Oh, tweezers are never as helpful <laughs> as you hope they would be. They never seem to work for really tiny things. Right. Okay. You you use your silicon tipped spatulas for moving things. You for said really so, yeah. small stuff. I do. Have you found there are any jobs or processes where you just haven't found the perfect tool for it yet? Or like where you'd like to invent something? Pins are never small enough or long okay. enough. I feel we need better pin holders with really fine, really long pins. What's your favourite scalpel blade? I think the 15. Everyone says that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Micro blades are really good as well. I find them really handy, especially the double bladed ones. Uh, do you use cocktail sticks or bamboo skewers for your swabs? Bamboo skewers. Have you ever used a swab jar that isn't a jam jar with holes poked in the lid? Yes, look at that. That is an actual um, solvent jar that's been <laughs> repurposed. Um, what do you keep your tools in? Just jars, nothing special. What's the most unusual thing that you've used as a conservation tool? Hmm can't think of anything very unusual but going back to what I was saying about the pin holders never quite working I'll often make my own by sticking a pin into a cocktail stick or attaching it to another tool or something like that sort of fabricating a tool that is the right length I like to make a handle kind of yeah okay um do you mark your tools to stop other people from stealing them in the conservation lab i don't but maybe i should yeah (laughs) how would you do it if you did because i've never found a foolproof method (laughs) oh yeah i guess you have to find the right um marker for it that doesn't come off easily yeah no no easy way is there what is your favorite tool and why um, my favourite tool are those little micro spatulas, just because they're so unbelievably pleasing. Um, you know, they're cute and they're practical. The sort you get from Tiranti, the mm. sculpture ones. Yeah, those are the ones. And just, you know, nice little bendy end, um, lovely for mixing stuff together. Yeah, I think they're my favourite tool. What do you use them for? Uh, mixing paints or just like applying um, adhesive or fillers Um, you can just get in all the little nooks and crannies yeah have you ever turned anything into a conservation tool that had a different original purpose Um, well I mean obviously there's the classics of cocktail sticks and kebab skewers Mm -hmm. Um, I think those are probably my most used tools god I, I, I think of them so much in terms of swabs and stuff it actually hadn't occurred to me that that wasn't their original purpose yeah. so yeah <laughs> yeah i think yeah co- a kebab skewer is probably the thing i use absolutely most often for swabs for poking at things yeah for, yeah breaking up making as part of packaging um yeah i think utterly versatile are there any jobs or processes where you haven't found the perfect tool for it yet um i mean sometimes you know, there's those moments where you've got something of a really funny shape and you end up, I don't know, elastic banding things mm. together and to try and get things at, at the right angle, propping it up with something else. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I think any objects patient end up with a lot of that. <laughs> we just don't have flat objects, do no. we? <laughs> What's your favourite scalpel blade? Ooh, Oh, I, I like, um, I can't remember the number, but I like the one where it's a flat end, like, um, so it, it actually... Like a chisel? Yeah, they're, they're very satisfying. I don't know what number that is. Mm, no, but they're, they're really, they're really, really nice for cutting back um, fills mm. on things, because, you know, it's that forward-facing blade, it's very good, and you're much less likely to cut your fingers on it because it's forward-facing. What do you keep your tools in? Um, I've got a little tool roll, um, which I have in my desk drawer, um, but I don't know, I mean, I sort of 
hit and miss that's those are the ones that are definitely my tools mm. work tools are just in the cupboard um but yeah these are the ones that i really don't want people to pinch do you mark them uh, I haven't quite reached that point, but I do make sure I'm back. Although I've lost a lot of needle nose pliers over the years, those are the ones that <laughs> someone has borrowed or and uh, you know put back in the wrong cupboard. Lost the little ends, and then they get all blunted, or they've dropped yeah. them on the floor point down. And it's a very sad day. <laughs> um, have you ever had a swab jar that isn't a jam jar with holes poked in the lid? I don't think our swab jar is a jam jar at the moment. We've just it's like one of those ordinary kind of, you know, chemical jars. Yeah. But a polypropylene lid. Yeah, Yeah, Flavia had one of them upstairs. What's the most expensive tool you've ever bought? Or the cheapest? Mmm. What have we bought recently? So I've got an I've got a really satisfying um vacuum tweezer set. That wasn't wildly expensive, but you know, on, on the more expensive side of things. But yeah, that that was oh, it's really nice that you just want make you want to pick up small things all day. I think that's it. I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. What is your favourite tool and why? So my favourite tool is a modified hacksaw blade, and it is quite long it's probably about 10 inches long so it's one of the sort of thicker um, larger hacksaw blades and it's been modified with um, by basically sharpening one end of it to a kind of saw point and then the other end has still got the hole in it that's used for attaching it to the saw and I use it as a needle for sewing plastazote and also for sawing plastazote when I'm trying to make something out of really big thick panels of it I find it a very useful thing oh wow Um, how how (laughs) firstly did you make I did yourself. not no I did not and that's one of the reasons why it's my favorite tool because it's got a sort of sentimental attachment so mm-hmm. this was this was made for me by my colleague David Singleton when I was working at the British Museum he made one for himself and one for me and uh, the reason we made them was because we were protecting a totem pole and the totem pole was being <laughs> hung from the ceiling in a daring feat of conservation while they were building a basic fire exit underneath it um, and in the course of that operation it was then um, wrapped in plastazote in order to uh, protect it and so we had to make these great sort of sheaths of plastazote by sewing large panels of it together with mm. uh, cotton tape and uh, so we needed a handy giant needle that could also be used for sort of cutting little bits of plastazote so that's what it's for and that's why I like it because it was an interesting project and it was made by a friend um, and it was a bit quirky oh okay <laughs> have you used it much since then or um, I don't I haven't used it as a needle very often but I have often used it for sewing lanols not I mean it's not very neat but it's certainly if you need to sort of hack mm. a bit off in order to use it for something then it's very good for that so it's it's not a, a refined tool in any way at all but I think it's there's something about its homemadiness that appeals to me and I think it's something a bit like conservation in general where we kind of figure something out from what we have to hand yeah. all the time have you found any tools that don't work for you that don't work for me um um I, I, I wouldn't say I have tools that I don't ever use I suppose I, I I tend to err on the side of not having very many I'm not I think mm. temperamentally I sort of I, I remember when I was a young conservator I worked in a place where there were was both a sort of Chinese school of how you deal with things and a Japanese school of how you deal with um, East, East Asian art particularly and uh, and the Japanese had a brush for every possible ramification and there was enormous levels of nuance in everything they were doing and they had racks and racks and racks of brushes and the Chinese uh, style was to have one or two brushes and you know and it was much, and I think spiritually I'm more the one or two brushes but then learn to use them and, and use them in quite a, a sort of um, yeah, try and acquire more skills in actually using them rather than having lots of different types. But, um, okay. I'm not suggesting that Japanese is not very highly skilled, of course they are. But, uh, Have you ever turned something into a conservation tool that had a different original purpose? Well, I guess that's an example, isn't it? Although it wasn't me yeah. that did it. <laughs> but uh, it, re- it reminded me that you can. Um, I suppose I meant un- unmodified as well. Um, have you ever found anything that um, was originally designed for something else and then thought, actually, this would be perfect for doing doing x uh, i can't think of any i think i quite often steal those funny um flat bamboo things that you get in coffee shops mm-hmm. to use as spatulas they're quite useful for sort of you can shave them down and because they're a bit disposable you can mess them up and use them for things they're quite useful for prying things open and that sort of stuff 
I'm sure a lot of conservatives do this. You look at sort of dental catalogues and uh, medical, mm. perhaps materials, so temporary supporting materials and splinting materials and that mm. kind of thing. Things that don't have to be archival but are part of a process that you're doing. That's for me. That you know, the, there's quite a lot of opportunity there. So while we're talking about medical catalogues, <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's your favourite scalpel blade? Oh, uh, I like number eleven. Oh, is that the super pointy one? Yes, because I don't have to scrape anything. If I had to scrape anything, I'd want to use number 15. But I like number 11 because I've got some lots of plaster soap. And it's quite long. It just it gives you that sharp, neat edge that I think is very subtle. I like 10A for the same yeah, reason. Yeah, they're very 11's advanced. a bit thinner. but Yeah, um... there, there's not much to choose. If I've got one or the other, I'm happy. <laughs> Do you use cocktail sticks or bamboo skewers for your swabs? Oh, I always use bamboo skewers. Mm. Yeah. Oh, cocktail sticks. No, I don't use them for that. Okay. Um, have you ever had a swab jar that isn't a jam jar with holes poked in no. the lid? <laughs> <laughs> I live in hope that one day somebody will come up with a really no, great but, different but, solution. You know, if, if I'm feeling swishy, it'll be a bon maman jar. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> oh, God, I didn't realise these were status <laughs> oh, symbols. Oh, no, I don't know if they are or not, but, you know, it's more pleasurable to have a pretty jar. What do you keep your tools in? I keep them in a plastic um, toolbox, but actually it took me quite a long time to locate one that I liked um, mm. because actually a lot of our tools are really long compared to what yeah. standard <laughs> tools are like, um, especially spatulas. And I also don't, I do quite like to keep my bamboo skewers and have a few spares and have some of those sticks that I've stolen from the coffee shop and all that kind of thing. Um, so I wanted to have... It's, it's quite a sort of long, flat one, but it has little slots that you can actually move around. So it comes with lots of oh, cool little square like bits of plastic yes. slot into these gaps. And then... you But you can take them out or move them around and rejig them so you know you can have small compartment for needles and stuff like that and then you can have big ones for whatever so yeah there's a certain order in it actually and I've got a kind of skeleton kit and then I have a bigger one for Mm -hmm. when I need to go somewhere and have the full range. Do you organise it in any particular way or? I suppose I I want to know where everything is for me but I mean there there aren't so many um, compartments that I can actually have a compartment for every different kind of thing so I tend to say all my spatulas and my um, pins will be in one place and scissors tend to be in another place mm-hmm. and blades are in a different place yeah I mean yeah so it, it works for me do you mark your tools to stop other people from nicking them no but I probably should because I, <laughs> I'm quite I'm, I'm quite generous with them actually when I have people working with me who are students who maybe don't have a full set yet or maybe mm. haven't got the particular thing that I've got um then I lend them but I have lost a few things that yeah. way um, I'm particularly keen I have some little snips which are actually they're like scissors but they've got a sort of springy thing and they're yeah. very useful for cutting very fine threads and I, I guard those jealously um, <laughs> whereas but scissors and tweezers are the things that tend to go walk yeah. about unfortunately what's the most expensive tool you've ever bought oh um, well I made a mistake actually I well I didn't buy it I asked for it for Christmas because I didn't have any money but it was a dial caliper and I never use it for anything <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, I wish I hadn't done that. But I, I lashed out. I went to Tarantis and bought some of those beautiful um, metal spatulas that they have. They have mm. a lot of different types, but I love the flexibility of those and the different shapes and so forth. And, and I don't regret the money that I spent on those at all. No. Um, yeah. I suppose individually they're not that pricey, but if you buy no, lots of different want, sizes... If you want then... a bit of a range, then, yeah. And I, I think it was also, you know, relative to my income at the time, because the thing is I've had them for a long, long time. They've, mm. They still are great i mean i occasionally sand them down and they sometimes go a bit rusty and you need to sort of re resurface them a bit but um yeah have you got anything else you say about tools on on the (laughs) subject of tool variety in that case thank you what is your favorite tool and why um i think it would have to be my paring knife um partly it's a wonderful sharp edge which I know very well and fits my hand nicely but part of it is all the blood sweat and tears which went into making it in the first place from a recycled hacksaw blade um it's it's a very special thing I'll lend most of my tools to other people but not that one Mm. so how did you make it um you take a a big industrial hacksaw blade it off at an angle you get rid of the hacksaw teeth and Mm -hmm. some of the paint and then you spend days flattening the back of it to get a really razor sharp edge it's very important that the back Mm. is flat and only then when that is as flat and polished as you can get it do you start making the bevel and that gives you a razor sharp knife so is it possible to buy ones or do you do you all have to make you can do yes but this was we just had a class in making them and 
yeah, it's a really satisfying thing to do and, and to learn to learn how to how to make something that sharp so that rivals a scalpel blade fresh out of the packet and just just to understand the principles the materials the type of steel um yeah really really interesting and what's your least favorite tool uh least favorite tool i think actually in this workshop <laughs> Uh, the um, the hole punch, which is oh. a very very old <laughs> twisted one, and it doesn't always come out of the paper cleanly, so it starts to tear at the hole that you've just made, which is exceedingly annoying. I'm going to replace it. Right, okay. nothing to do with conservation at all, but things that don't work like literally that really a hole wind punch. me up. <laughs> hole punch for punching yes holes papers. in paper. I can punch. <laughs> oh right, paper. I wasn't sure that was a yes, special. Yes. Book no, 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 just, <laughs> just a hole punch. Just a hole punch. <laughs> Um, have you have you found any tools that um, you find other people like, but you just find they don't work for you? Yes, quite a lot of people um, going back to pairing knives, like French pairing knives, which are a rounded end blade. And I should like them. I should be able to get on with them, but I just don't. I prefer the English straight sort. So yeah. <laughs> insert comment about brexit here possibly <laughs> but <laughs> that's not no um have you come across any jobs or processes where you haven't quite found the perfect tool yet or where you feel as if you'd mm. want to invent a tool um that's a difficult one i think more it's about having for me personally it's about having a very select small bunch of tools that mm. are absolutely right for you mm. and then you can do a lot with those and I have various spatulas and things which I've shaped and they work for me and I think that's that's very important how it fits in your hand so that it becomes an extension of your hand rather than having to think about using a tool so mm. the knife when it's really sharp you have to think about it it does the work for you you don't have to force and push and get anxious mm. have you ever turned something into a conservation tool that had a different original purpose Yes, um, I have a very, I'm very fond of my dental pick, which I got from mm. my lovely dentist. Oh, you actually so, got it yes, from did, the yes, dentist? Yes, yes, it's a particular one I <laughs> wanted. And um, eventually she said, OK, because my family has been going to her practice since before I was born. So um, she thought she could possibly part with an, <laughs> an old tool, which was no good to her anymore. So what's special about this one? It's just got a, a very nice... Um, flat edge um it's not sharp but it's it's a sort of a blunted sharpness which is very good just for scraping away layers of glue on the back of a spine mm. or, um, just just that sort of delicate job where you need something hard but very very tiny just to to, to scrape back layers yeah. uh, what's your favorite scalpel blade scalpel blade is the little um little tiny round one um 15, 15 yeah do you favor swabs made from cocktail sticks or bamboo skewers bamboo skewers why um just they wind round better um there's mm-hmm. more to get hold of they're they're slightly bendy but with a i find um cocktail sticks nice the idea to have them small but if you put any pressure on them at all they break rather than yeah. rather than flexing whereas the bamboo you can just encourage to flex slightly uh what's your swab jar is it a jam jar with holes in the lid uh no, actually, I generally tend to have a little little sort of old card box on the table and put them in there. A box? Yes, one ah. of those little plastic things that business cards come in. That's that's all right. I, we, we don't use terribly many swabs for cleaning and book yeah. conservation, but when we do, that's what I collect them in, and uh-huh. then I decide what to do with them after that. Oh, well, that's good. I was, I was just looking for alternatives to the jam jar with oh, the okay. <laughs> holes, in the, <laughs> holes in the lid. So that they can breathe. <laughs> what do you keep your tools in, and um, how are they organised? They are organised according to things for folding, so bone folders and pokey things, so um, needles, um, all that sort of thing, scissors in the top drawer, and then always for me, the third drawer down is a knife drawer. Just always. because it always because is. it always is, and the second drawer down in the middle is for compressing sticks and sanding blocks and useful things like that. Mm more the sort of wooden things which don't like to argue with metal mm. metal edges otherwise they get dented so you keep yours in drawers yes are they ever portable yes i, I put them in a little bag and yeah trot off to go and do repairs elsewhere do you mark them um tend not to because mm. i find that actually i want a surface which is very polished with things like folders it's very mm. tempting to mark but as soon as you start writing on them you get transfer yeah. of things and if you start scratching your name into them then you get an unsmooth surface so generally i know them 
by their look and feel. Okay. <laughs> have you had, ha- ever had any uncomfortable uh, situations where you... <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Um, um, a former colleague um, found what he thought was a was a, a new bone folder having lost his and, and shaped it to his own purposes and I couldn't find mine for weeks and weeks and then suddenly realised that it had been reshaped. <laughs> Which was, which was actually quite funny. It was a good colleague and, you know, we yeah. got over it, but it was, yes. Who got custody in the end? It came back to me in the end, but it was a completely different shape. And it's very good for its new purpose, but it's not the one I last saw. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, finally, what's the most expensive tool you've ever bought and the cheapest? Gosh, um, most expensive... Mm probably some of the finishing tools for book binding decorating bindings it's it's rare that we need to use them in conservation work but there are occasions when you have a new spine on an old book and probably redoing somebody else's rebacking so you've got no original to go on um, Mm -hmm. and if it has to fit in a in a historic interior it needs to look right as well Mm -hmm. some of the tools are very expensive but on the other hand um, they last a lifetime I don't mind spending money on a good tool if it's good quality and it will see me out, that's great. Mm. I spend not much money on something that's plasticky and cheap and falls to pieces or using it one day that really winds me up. Thank you. Not at all. <laughs> so thanks very much to Flavia, Sophie, Jenny and Edward for those responses. It's really nice that everyone, even just from the same place in the same group of museums, uses tools so differently in the different things that we get up to as conservators. It's really nice to hear from everyone yeah Yeah, I was particularly interested to talk to Edward because he's a book of manuscripts yeah so he had completely different set of Uh uh, tools from what I did and um, the thing he chose was something I would not have any use for particularly and would would, hadn't really kind of come across as an idea so I've been talking to the nice guys at preservation equipment and uh, we got chatting about Japanese tissue and Mm -hmm. how conservators use it and what sort of qualities they like from the Japanese tissue. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm terrible at knowing my Japanese tissues. I think this is because I'm not a paper conservator <laughs> uh, or an art conservator or anything like that. So I tend to use what's on hand, which often is unlabeled material at best, yeah. which is problematic because it's not very helpful to me to know what to order next time because I can't exactly wave a piece of paper vaguely at the screen and go, this, this one, whatever this was, whatever this was. So it's very unhelpful because I know there are loads of different grades and different kinds. Yeah, It's like a whole mission mm. to just know your Japanese tissue. Issues. I, Last I time I ordered some, I ordered them based on what the descriptions said and my memory of what I'd used before and what I found useful. Mm-hmm. And I also ordered three different types, basically a, a thick, medium and thin yeah. for, for various uses. Um, yeah. So I feel like I more have an idea of what I use stuff for yeah. and the kind of physical qualities I want rather than the names yeah. and the particular grammage yeah but I, I suppose that's the important thing isn't it like what's the uh, yeah what the qualities uh-huh. are really because i tend to favor like one that's a bit thicker mm-hmm. and one that's a bit thinner which is yeah unhelpful i know but like the thin stuff i use for, i want something that's like really thready if that makes sense mm-hmm. like has long fibers yeah because that's quite good for when you make fake mm. fur um oh, and it's very uh-huh. good for like just getting a kind of stringy edge so that you can it, it attaches yeah nicely. yeah good and it, grippage yeah but still really thin so mm-hmm. you can't really see it as with the thicker stuff is useful for paper labels for mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. or hinges sometimes so what we robust. do what do we what we use what do we use it for we use it for um like invis- invisible supports yeah uh, or as invisible as they can be yeah um introducing into surfaces to provide support yeah structural things like hinging yeah on mounts mm-hmm. um and then has have any of us done like uh separating out the fibers creating a mash or a fill yeah yeah i've done yeah, that yeah, yeah. But the, yeah. again, that's yeah. when the like long fibers really mm-hmm. help. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. But I think I just like things with kind of long, mm. long fibers. Really, Christina, what do you use Japanese tissue for? So I, I've I've made a pulp out of Japanese tissue yeah. and Clues LG to fill gaps in wood because it's quite lightweight and you can mold yeah. it mm-hmm. a bit. Yeah, same. Um, because I've been working on 
almost exclusively on ethnographic collections this year. I've used Japanese tissue a lot. Um, mm. I've made a lot of Frankenstein twists to bridge gaps and to repair fibres of things and as replacement threads and strings for objects and to replace a plaited cord in one case all that sort of thing so so that's quite a lot structural, structural isn't it yeah things. yeah I've, I've also used it i was going to say um on things like egyptian mummies and animal mummies and so on where you're trying to replace bindings and you're trying to get the quite a coarse linen weave fabric to join onto another piece of coarse linen ah. weave fabric and one of the good ways to do that is to interleave a piece of japanese tissue because it just provides much greater surface area mm-hmm, for the yeah. adhesive mm-hmm. and you get a much better join between things so i've quite often used it as a sort of interleaving thing in fact with the flexible spatulas that i was talking about earlier oh yeah, oh, yeah. For that kind of thing you can so that those are the those are the things i think it's supposed to be interesting to hear from listeners what kinds of things they use japanese tissue yeah. for and the, obviously with this is very much an objects conservation answer we've given. But yeah, so there'll be different book ones. Book and paper for will be things. vastly different. Yeah, furniture. exactly. And I used it to cover the magnets that oh, were yeah. being used to oh, mount yeah. Yeah, that's right. because the Japanese tissue's got a very sympathetic kind of texture so that when mm-hmm. you dye it and then mm. cover the magnet it doesn't have that kind of smooth shiny acrylic look to it mm. yeah so I suppose that, so that's an interesting one that the surface texture really matters yeah. to us yeah. like that, yeah, visually totally. what it does yeah but yeah so I'd, I'd love to hear from listeners out there like what what you use it for and why you choose that particular type of tissue because obviously there are loads of different kinds Mm -hmm. so like what what is it you enjoy about that one is it like the fiber length the strength is it actually the thickness like does it need to be really robust or Mm -hmm. is it better if it's a thinner one i'm really curious how people do use it and i'd I'd just love to hear your views on it to be honest yeah so yeah get in touch i would love to hear i i love japanese tissue just in general so like i would love to hear more about it learn more about it please that would be great if you're enjoying the c word and would like to support our work then please consider becoming one of our patrons for as little as one dollar per month you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. That's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. And a warm welcome to our patrons, Stephen and Alana. Thanks for joining the gang, guys. Thanks for listening. We're the C word and you've been listening to Christina Rosaic, Chloe Rumsey and me, Jenna Mathiasen. Join us next time for a Christmas special. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the Seaword Podcast, or simply email us on theseawordpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by DD Music, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson and Orion Williams. This has been a Wooden Dice production. Coffee's finally hitting me. <laughs> Hashtag outtakes. <laughs> there are so many good outtakes from my. Um... I put that at the end of the episode, you know, yes. like a little thing of. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>